We went all the way over to 1 John this morning. And uh, I guess it's just kind of been the theme, the return of Christ. We talked about that this morning. And um, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Asking ourselves a question. Will Jesus really come back? In 1942, General Douglas MacArthur. Guy looked like a soldier, didn't he? He was forced to leave the Philippines. The Japanese were a terror. He, when I say he was forced, he did not want to go. But the president, cabinet, knowing how important he was, forced him to leave the Philippines. As a result of that, Japanese captured the islands. But before he left them, made them a promise. And it went on to be a, a much used phrase. He told the Philippine people, I shall return. Many people doubted. Not only the Filipino people, but people in our own government. said, I shall return. And I, I looked up a little bit of history on it, and I found out that um, the Filipino people, now under the aggression of Japan, rallied around that. They had so much respect for General MacArthur. And he said, I shall return. They believed it. Some doubted. The fall of 1944, he did return. And he defeated the Japanese army. And he retook the Philippines just as he said he would. What a great story. Most of us have, especially those people that have been raised in church, most of us have heard about the return of Christ for a long time. I've been hearing about it ever since I was eight, nine, ten years old. Old enough, cognizant enough to really understand the basics of the return of Christ. I've heard countless sermons, read scores of books, but so many videos sung about it. On and on and on, the return of Christ. We have heard it so much, there can almost be an inherent danger. Hearing something so much, time goes on, seem to be any signs of it happening, although we talked about some of them this morning. 
the recipients of this letter that Peter wrote must have felt that way. You got to remember, when Peter wrote this, it's virtually 2,000 years ago. So we've been hearing it all down through the years. Christ came, he fulfilled his calling, he did the Father's mission, as I said this morning. Afterwards, he went back to the Father. But before he left, he said, I'll return. We use General MacArthur's phrase, I shall return. Let's focus on that tonight. And we're really going to do it keeping in mind probably the audience to which this letter was written. We're talking about the second coming of Christ. First, it's been doubted. It's been doubted. First Peter chapter 3, or Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. There shall come in the last days, we used that this morning, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Hold on to that walking after their own lusts and saying, here it is, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They go all the way back. The scoffers go all the way back to what some of them had read as far as the Old Testament prophecies were concerned. Then you move forward to the people of their day who had preached, taught this. And the scoffer said, we've been hearing this forever and ever and ever. And they say, where is his coming? Peter refers to him as a scoffer, it means one who mocks. Literally what they were doing. One who makes fun of, if you will. To these people, God and His Word and His promises are nothing but a joke. Peter said they did this because they walk after their own lust. Those who are scoffers, when Simon Peter wrote this, and those who are scoffers today are walking after their own lust, they get enjoyment. Make no doubt about that, a lost, scoffing world who doesn't have anything at all for Christianity, nothing. Every day that goes by, and they know we have gathered, like this evening, talking about the return, the second coming of Christ, and tomorrow they get up and Christ did not come. You know what they do? They take joy in that. It makes them happy. Scoffers to make fun of, to mock. Going back in history, we can see these have always been around. People in Noah's day did this, remember? God commissioned Noah to build a ship for the saving of mankind. Noah went to work. He was a preacher. He was bivocational. He also turned into a boat builder. I don't know how much experience Noah had on boat building, 
but he had a great architect. He had a great designer. So he went to work. It took. You can only imagine how long it took to build that vessel. All the detail that had to go into it. The waterproofing, everything else was phenomenal. He built outside. You can envision this. The townspeople are coming by. Have you been down to see the crazy old man Noah yet? He's building a boat. It never rained. He's building a boat. They had to laugh, mock, make fun of Noah. There came a day when it began to rain. Can you imagine some of those people going around, what's that? It began to rain. And it continued to rain on and on and on and on. So much that the depths begin to close up and the water begin to rise. And you know the whole story. There's no reason for me going all the way through it. I'm focusing on the scoffers, the one that laughed at Noah. In the end, they realized that what God said came true. Then the people of Sodom, remember them? They said the same thing. They did the same thing. God spoke to Lot. Who had gone to Sodom and completely against the will of God. Abraham said, go where you want. That's where he went. Uncle Abe. That's where he went. Fertile valleys. He ended up in Sodom, which had to be the Twin Cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, had to be one of the wickedest spots on earth. Rapid sexual impropriety, wickedness, all sorts of sexual perversion. It was horrible. It was no place for a man of God to be and his family. And that's where he went. And he stayed there. He had his wife there, who met a disastrous end, by the way, in the end. His daughters, his sons-in-laws. God had mercy on Lot because of his relationship with Abraham. God had mercy on him sent the angel and said, get out. It's actually sent a couple in the form of a human. Sit, get out. Get out. Lot actually received that message. Went to his family and told them. His wife begrudgingly, she had evidently fell right into the lifestyle somewhat, the society part. She begrudgingly left. The daughters went as well. The sons-in-laws, not interested. Not interested. They mocked at Lot, telling that God was going to destroy that city. But in the end, that's exactly what happened. Scoffers, they've always been around. They're still around today. These people, and we've talked about it a moment ago when we were talking about that they do this because of their lusts, the lust of their flesh. They walk after their own lust. People today who scoff enjoy doing that because of sin. They enjoy sin. They see Christ hasn't returned. Therefore, they come to the conclusion that he never will. I'll be honest with you. I think the greatest reason to be saved 
is just fall in love with Jesus because he died for you. But most of us probably, before we fell in love with Jesus and realized that he died for us, we got panicky. I did. I heard the message. I applied it to other people. And I finally realized, that's for me. That's what I need to hear. I'm the one that's lost. I'm the one that's not ready if Christ was to come back. It was at that point, far, far before I fell in love with Jesus Christ, it was at that point that I concluded, I don't want to die like this. I don't want to go to hell. And I went down and got saved. That was the motivation. One of the reasons that people are not saved today, they love sin. They've heard the message over and over about the return of Christ. It doesn't have any effect on them anymore. So the second coming of Christ is doubted, right? Still is today. Second thing, the second coming of Christ is determined. Determined. Notice verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. He's talking about the scoffers. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's what we were talking about. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter said they were willingly ignorant. Now, he was not just trying to use a slang term on them. Ignorant means just unlearned, not aware of something. But they were willingly unaware. They weren't interested. They refused to consider some facts. They doubted the sovereignty of God. God can enter time any time He chooses, and He has numerous times. They don't know God is bound by His Word. The Word of God hangs on the return of Christ. You ever thought about that? If Jesus Christ, and that was the title of the message, will Jesus really come again? If Jesus Christ does not come again, everything in this Bible falls apart. There's no reason to believe any of it. Because he made that promise. And if he breaks that promise, none of it can be trusted. None of it. None of it. But I want to show you sometimes Peter talks about that God entered into the world and affected the world. First, at its formation. That little phrase, and God said, nine times in the first chapter. Of Genesis. Nine times we read that, and God said, and God said, God said, let there be light, let, you know, and God said, God enter end to the world and affected the world. That was at the time of the formation. Then during the flood, we talked about that. The scoffers in Noah's day, they laughed at him. But it happened because God said that it would. God entered into the world at that flood. But he mentions another one in verse 7. Not only at its formation and by the flood, but by the fire. Verse 7 tells of a fire that will cleanse the earth. Now, there's been a lot of speculation down through the years on exactly how that will be accomplished. I heard growing up all of my life that it could be a nuclear holocaust. God would choose to cleanse this world by fire that way. I don't know. 
I don't think the Bible is really definitive enough, and I'm not using that in a negative context. God just is to the point. He said, I'm going to cleanse this world by fire, by fire. Peter wrote of it in verse 7. How he does that, that's up to you, Father. It's nothing to me. But I believe that it will happen because God said that it would. There's so much wickedness and filth and dross in this world today. I don't think a flood would do it. I think it needs to be by fire. I think that's how it'll happen. And if we, as we move toward the fact that the United States at one time was the nuclear power, right? Now they're all over the world. And some of these little old small countries now have nuclear capabilities. It would be so easy. Most all of them do. Some of the leaders of this world, the guy in North Korea and some of these people, whew, when you look at some of the people that all they have to do is just say, do it, it could be a scary thing. Don't scare me. Before that happens, I'm going to be out of here, as I said this morning. But it's a scary thought. Some of the power, the atomic power that some of these small countries possessed, Christ's second coming is determined. It will happen. It's doubted, yes, but it is determined. It will happen. Make no doubt about it. Now, last point. Christ's second coming is delayed. It's delayed. Look at verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some man counts slackness, but is, here it is, long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's where we are right now. The second coming of Christ is delayed, and it has been ever since He finished His work. We talked about it this morning. When John wrote that little letter, they were looking for the return of Christ then, 2,000 years ago. And Peter was writing, they're looking for the return of Christ. It had already been delayed to them. Now look on how long it's been delayed to us. And we've heard of it and heard of it. But there's still three things we'll close with. First, there's a reality. Verse 8. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What does that mean? God doesn't view time the way man does. He is totally unaffected by time. It means nothing. And by the way, there have been people with all of the technology we have now and all the computers and everything, all the resources, who have tried to determine through long, drawn-out multiplications and all kinds of, of mathematical work, they've tried to determine this one day of thought. This was not an actual formula, I don't believe. God is just saying the way we think of time and the way I think of time, the way man thinks of time, and the way I think of time, God said it's totally different. And he uses that hyperbia. Um, man thinks of a thousand years, I, just one day. And it puts it in a context to me. And it's a reality. Second, there's a reminder, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. God is not dragging his feet. Because he has not come back yet, he's not a slacker. We use that term sometimes. 
He's a God of order. He always has been. He has a purpose in everything he does. And that brings us to the third point. There's a reality, there's a reminder, and there's a reason. It's in verse 9. He is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why does God delay his coming? We opened up with that. We've heard this and heard it and heard it and heard it. Christ is coming back. And it's easy to fall into the world's way of thinking. I've heard that all my life. There's a reason. And the reason is God loves people. He loves mankind. He is not willing that any should perish. Perish means more than just dying. It means spiritually dying, spiritual death. It means dying unsaved and going to hell. God is not willing that anyone goes to hell. Anyone that ever paints a picture and says God sits on his throne when someone dies lost and goes to hell and God goes, that's ridiculous. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God proved and demonstrated just how much he loves mankind. He gave the best that he had. He gave his own darling son to die a horrible, cruel death in place of me and you and everyone else in the world because we're all sinners by birth. Jesus died for us, and it pleased the Father, the Scripture says. He tarries to give lost people a chance. There are people today who are not ready for the Lord Jesus Christ. This day, this 24-hour period is not up yet, but we're in the latter part of it what if what if they make it through this day Jesus did not return they received a gracious blessing if Jesus had come this day or comes in the remainder of this day it'll be great for me it'll be wonderful for me I'll be out of here but for those who are not ready It'll be horrible. And God loves the world so much that he delays his coming to give mankind another opportunity to be saved. I'm so thankful. I'm grateful on a personal note that from the time I realized I was lost and I was not saved immediately, But from the time I realized that I was lost, going back to what I said a moment ago, I realized that's for me. It was probably a year and a half or two years before I actually was saved. What if Christ would have come back during that time in my life? You know the answer. I would have died lost. But God delayed his coming. And I am so thankful for it. And that ought to give, that ought to give a new challenge to every one of us. Raise up your hand with me. How many have people in your family who theoretically should be the closest people we have on earth, our family? How many people have people in your family that are lost? All over the building all over the building. We have people in our families that are lost. And then when you factor into that also, we have friends that are just like family to us, but they're lost. We have those. God is delaying His coming. And that brings the challenge to us. We need to beat the doors down to try to win them to Christ. Ronnie, I may offend them. I'd rather offend them than see them die and go to hell. Take a chance. Take a risk. 
love them that much to tell them about Jesus because God is delaying His coming for that very purpose. Don't take that for granted. I hope a lost world doesn't, but I'm afraid they are. He said, I shall return. And He will. He will. Because everything in the Word of God hinges on whether He's coming back or not. Amen? Will Christ return? You better believe it. You better believe it.